I just want to thank all of you for letting me have this opportunity to teach you. This is my first time doing this and I am really excited. Uh, so uh, let's get started. Okay guys, this, this is important. Um, at the beginning of class I handed out a worksheet uh, that had um, all these key terms and a timeline on it. This will be your notes uh, for, uh, for this video. And uh, anything in red is a person or a term that you need to know. And anything in blue is an important event or date for your timeline. You can write down a brief explanation of the term or event, but you're also able to draw pictures or any other way of taking notes that will help you guys memorize uh, the information. class yesterday we watched a video about the Spanish-American War and how that led from the Treaty of Paris to the United States acquisition of Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippine Islands. Today we will learn how the United States tried to extend its so-called sphere of influence in Asia, in particular uh, the Philippines, uh, China, and Japan. Um, but we're going to be paying close attention to the reaction of these certain countries and their populations to the presence of the United States. So what's a sphere of influence? A sphere of influence uh, is a country or area in which another country or person has the power to affect the developments or actions, uh, although it has no authority to do so. The United States and the Philippines have had strong diplomatic ties for decades, but you would never guess that by listening to Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. Since taking office in June 2016, Duterte has unleashed an aggressive campaign against the United States, threatening to halt joint military exercises. Assistance of America, it may be a lesser quality of life, but I said we will survive. And if there is one thing I would like to prove to America and to everybody, is that there is such a thing as the dignity of the Filipino people. Thank you. Now, we're going to see this type of resentment towards the United States by. Uh, the Filipino government uh, and the people uh, in the past when we look at uh, the Filipino and American rebellion. Uh, the majority of the Filipino population, like Emilio Aguinaldo, felt betrayed by the United States' decision to maintain its control over their country and not return it to the Filipino population. Um, Emilio Aguinaldo, because of this, organized what's called an insurrection against the United States that lasted for two long years using a military tactic called guerrilla warfare. Now, an insurrection is basically a rebellion. Um, however, the United States wouldn't call the Filipino uh, uh, rebellion a rebellion because that would make the United States out to be an impressive uh, tyrant. Um, so they called it an insurrection. Now, guerrilla warfare is a non-traditional form of warfare, usually involving small bands of fighters. And this is when, like a a country or a group of people aren't strong enough to fight someone on head on. <laughs> the general outcome of the war was impacted the most by the capture of Emilio Aguinaldo in 1901. 
Um, without him, the war basically uh, ended really quickly. And in 1901, William Howard Taft, the future president of the United States, is placed as the governor of the Philippines. And he starts enacting a series of reforms that really benefited the the population of the Philippines and improve their quality of life greatly. There are a lot of medical reforms, educational reforms, um, a lot of infra infrastructural reforms, but it just all shows that uh, the United States is really focused on improving and developing the Philippines. But the high point for the people of the Philippines are, is in 1916 with the Jones Act. And the Jones Act basically states that the Philippine population will eventually be able to govern themselves. And the key words, eventually. And uh, it's a long time until this is in, enacted. Uh, and that's it's after World War II that it is. 